but they have done it for political reasons. Probably the greatest or most notorious example was in the latter days of the Franklin Roosevelt administration, where in the early part of that administration, the Supreme Court struck down a number of pieces of very important legislation in the New Deal that, that Roosevelt had proposed, struck them down on constitutional grounds. The president threatened uh, to pack the court. He wanted a statute to increase uh, the composition, the size of the courts who could put his own people on. He didn't get that, but a number of justices resigned. They had reached uh, retirement age or they were sick and tired of, of going on with the process. And Roosevelt was able to put some of his own people on, uh, Douglas and Frankfurter and Stone and Black and so forth. And then all of a sudden we discovered that the Commerce Clause meant something other than it had meant for a 100 years. And a number of these uh, uh, radical Supreme Court decisions came forward, which, the effect of which, was to expand the power of Congress. But they were unconstitutional decisions. The Supreme Court makes mistakes in the same way that Congress makes mistakes. The unfortunate thing is, too many people in this country think that when the Supreme Court makes a decision, somehow that decision has a permanent effect on the Constitution. And to my, you know, use lawyer language, baloney. Of course it doesn't. The Supreme Court changes its mind all the time. It's, it's, it has reversed itself on constitutional decisions dozens of times. So if you look at the, from the practical side, yes, the Supreme Court, as a matter of practice, has allowed Congress and the President to do things that the Constitution doesn't allow them to do. Has that changed the law? No. What's the problem? That the people who should be in control, that is, we the people, are not taking the necessary steps to enforce that law, that to, to wit the Constitution. I hear you, Doctor. All right, thank you for that call there, Richard. Let's go over here. True P, what's your question for Dr. Vera? Hi. I'd kind of like to ask a question and start at the top, if you don't mind. Okay. When it, when it relates to George Bush and his commitment to the Constitution that he swore to uphold, and knowing, which you've got to know, that Obama is coming into office and that there's an issue, can he not do anything? Can he not be held responsible due to the Constitution and what he's sworn to do to, to protect the country and that sort of thing? The Constitution requires in Section 3 of Article 2 that the President take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That is his constitutional duty. So at this point in time, actually for quite some point in time, uh, he had the obligation, I would think, to have directed some people over there in the Justice Department to conduct an investigation on this eligibility question. As far as I understand, they never did it. So I would seriously question whether he has taken his constitutional duties anywhere near the uh, the level uh, to which they should have been taken. But, you know, I don't think that there's a big difference between the uh, Bush administration and what's coming in as the Obama administration. I mean, these people all seem to be going down the same track, don't they? Yeah, they seem to me like that they're going to do it their way. They don't give a damn about anything else. That's exactly right. So it doesn't surprise me that he's acting that way. I am. Uh, I suppose I will be a little surprised uh, not to see the uh, the Supreme Court eventually do something here, because in a sense this is the, they're the last bastion. But I've come to the conclusion that there is so much corruption in the political realm, and I mean that not in the sense of people taking money you know, under the table, but the system is simply corrupted by uh, careerism and, and ideology and factionalism and so forth and so on, that until the people themselves uh, reassert their authority through their constitution, we're never going to see any change here. We're going to see things get worse and worse and worse until finally the monetary system comes out on their head. That's the real weak link in this whole system, the monetary and banking structures, because they're inherently flawed. And there's no way out of that other than replacing them, which will require changing a lot of attitudes or a lot of personalities in our political institutions, or seeing them collapse. Okay, Dr. Vera, uh, that's an excellent answer. Thank you, caller. Thank you for that call. Let's go up here to Joe on line two. Joe, what's your question for Dr. Vera? Uh, good evening. A uh, little quick comment first. I think those militias need to focus on the 17th Amendment so the states can have representation in Washington again. That's another good question. Uh, but my question is the Red Amendment book. Are you familiar with it, and could you comment on it if you are? 
Well, no, I'm not sure what you're talking about there. What is the Red Amendment? Well, it's a it's a, it's a book someone is trying to get me to read, and, I, and it, it has all to do with the 14th Amendment. My personal belief is, yes, we have to go back to the 14th Amendment and clean things up if we want to restore our republic, because it, it, you know that it, everything went awry for, for, from that point on, and get rid of the 16th and the 17th. Uh, but you know, that, I was wondering if you knew about that book. I thought perhaps you were familiar with no, it. No, I'm going to let somebody else not, talk. Not that book okay, thank you. Okay, let's go down here. This is Brock on Street. He wants to talk to me. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Mr. Ed? Yeah. Yeah, this is me and Boy. I'll call again. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. What's, what's yeah, going on? And just ask questions, please. Uh, okay, go ahead. Does Obama Z get elected next week, or, or do they do a blockage on him? What do you think, Dr. Vera? I think his question was, is Barack Obama going to be uh, inaugurated or not? He's going to go through the ceremony, yes. I think so. I, th I think that was a Barack Obama supporter. All right, we got uh, Nick on line four. Nick, what's your question for uh, Dr. Vera? Yeah, my question is uh, his uh, experience with the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm referring specifically to the influence of the clerks upon the justices and primarily to a recent article uh, in which the late Chief Justice uh, made a comment about how much the clerks influence uh, the ideology of the court. Do you feel that the justices are really, in fact, seeing these cases in front of them, and are they actually getting the right information, or are the clerks able to direct these cases to their own ideology? Well, I certainly think that the clerks play a very important role in filtering out what eventually gets to the justices because they have a huge caseload, and they assign to the clerks the uh, job of looking at the initial paperwork that's filed, usually these petitions for certiorari, legal briefs that are filed, and then coming up with memoranda that distill down uh, the essences of the case as the clerks see it, and then probably recommend to a certain extent, is this a worthy case to look at or isn't it? Now, and, and, and there's, been a, there's been some what I would call kiss and tell literature that has come out of the court. A man by the name of Edward, Edward Lazarus wrote a book several years ago. I can't quite remember the title. Uh, he had been a clerk in the court, and he tells some uh, behind-the-scenes stories of kind of the infighting that goes on and maneuvering the, and political uh, uh, argumentation that goes on within the court, left and right, and the left and right of the political spectrum. So the clerks do have, a, uh, what I would say, a tremendous amount of practical influence there. But if you look at a case along the line, and, and that would also go even to a case that's important because they may do a lot of research and provide that kind of information to the justices, and the justices may very well not go behind that research and check to make sure whether it's really valid. But in a case like this eligibility question, this matter is so notorious that I would find it hard to believe that the justices are not themselves looking at the petitions that are filed. They're not just taking the clerk's words for it. They're actually looking at them. I would hope that that's the case. But I'm fairly sure that in a large number of cases, many of which may be meritorious on other issues, that no, the, the clerk sends up a memorandum a couple pages long, judge takes a cursory, justice takes a cursory look at that, says this isn't worth doing, and when time comes to vote on whether they will hear the case or not, just votes no, and hundreds and hundreds of those cases disappear just that way. But I think with this Obama situation, the, the, the stakes are so high that I can't believe that they're not looking. I mean, that would really be a dereliction of duty if they weren't looking at these very in very, very detailed fashion. Okay, uh, Nick, we thank you for that call. Let's go up here to Jim before I bring Jim up. We still got a bunch. We got one line open right now, folks. Okay, Jim, what's your question for uh, Dr. Vera? Hi, Dr. Vera. Really great to hear you uh, speak here tonight. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. How do you, do you see this, what's going on, you know, not not just the Obama situation, the eligibility situation, but the, the world financial crisis and other important matters, all yoking together on the same or pulling for global government? Oh, yes, yes. And in a sense, it's from two perspectives, too. Of course, there's been a plan for a long time for global government. I mean, it goes all the way back to before the League of Nations, for heaven's sake, after World War One. 
this isn't something that was invented by the Bush administration. And so people are, on that side are taking specific steps to try and promote as much as possible the development of the, you know, these institutions, whether they're financial or political. But then on the other side, they also have what I would call Plan B, which is to take advantage of every crisis that may occur naturally that they don't cause and try to use that to advance the cause of global government. So you look at the present monetary crisis in this country, Federal Reserve System as a practical matter is uh, a world central bank because Federal Reserve currency has been used as a world reserve currency since Bretton Woods right after World War, Bretton Woods agreement right after World War II. The thing is inherently unstable. It's starting to shake itself to pieces. Uh, one solution to that is the one I and others propose. Let's go back to a proper currency within this country. The globalists look at this crisis and say, well, this is now an opportunity for us to drive the system in the direction of a regional currency such as the Amero, which has had a certain amount of play in the media, or perhaps even a global currency. It's another way we can use 